Sharon and I ha will have the opportunity to uh, discuss with her. I would like to kick off the discussion by asking her, what are the main factors and strategies that have enabled Singapore to become such an amazing success story in a leading maritime hub? And if I can also ask, do you consider Singapore to be a regional hub or a global maritime hub? Sure, yeah. First of all, a very good uh, morning to all of you and to our overseas guests. A very warm welcome uh, to Singapore. Um, just a, a very quick introduction. Um, MPA, or Maritime Port Authority, is the authority that looks after both the regulations as well as commercial shipping. Uh, and now, uh, in answer to Nicholas' question, I think that um, we, we first started off taking advantage of our geographical location because we were at the crossroads and we are at the crossroads of uh, east-west trade. And actually that makes uh, fiscal cargoes uh, coming to Singapore um, uh, um, give us that fiscal flow of cargo because we are the last port of call for the Europe trade. And we are also situated in the uh, growth area of uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, so they, that gave us um, the advantage that we could actually uh, started, uh, start off with. Uh, over time, then we took a bold decision to go into containerization in the uh, late 1970s because uh, we see that as a potential for us to further leverage on our position. That served us well, but as we know, uh, competition will catch up, so everybody goes towards container containerization as well. So then we, one day we took a hard look at uh, what should we uh, do next. Um, and then we realised at that time that we need to restructure ourselves, just like companies restructure themselves. So uh, in 2004, we took a decision to move the commercial aspects of shipping, which resided then in Trade Development Board, uh, which is under the Ministry of Trade and Industry, to the Ministry of Transport. Uh, by doing that, we become a one-stop agency uh, for anything on shipping. So it means that our relationship with the customer would actually be better focused. Customers don't need to go all over the place just to find uh, answers uh, to their questions. Um, that served us well. Uh, in addition, uh, because the port is quite a land-intensive business and Singapore is essentially a transshipment port, more than 80% of our uh, throughput are actually transshipment cargo, uh, which then means that um, the next challenge for us is really looking at what additional business lines we should actually be incorporating into the MPA portfolio in order to ensure a much more sustainable shipping going forward. And that was also the period when we decided then we should actually look at uh, growing Singapore into an international maritime centre because uh, we feel that if you are able to do both the port business as well as the non-port business, bringing the business adjacencies around the port to Singapore, then collectively we will be in a stronger position to serve um, the shipping community. So that, that was uh, how we actually started off and where we are today. Um, as to whether we see ourselves more as a regional or um, a global um, uh, port or IMC, actually personally I think that we are actually much more a global player than a regional player for the various reasons. Uh, one, uh, in terms of uh, port throughput, um, last year we did 36.6 million TU of container throughput, uh, which places us second in the world after um, Shanghai. Yeah. Um, uh, it was actually a good growth for us. We had a 8.7% growth um, uh, last year. Uh, two, in terms of um, the number of shipping companies in Singapore, uh, we would have the highest concentration of uh, shipping groups in Singapore. Today, we've got 150 international groups uh, that are based in Singapore. Uh, in terms of ancillary services, for, for example, the uh, PNI clubs, uh, we have 10 today as compared to maybe two about um, a, a decade or more uh, ago. And, um, and also in terms of um, the number of shipbrokers, I, I think uh, today we have got quite a big number of uh, shipbroking community in Singapore, which is essential because uh, then you actually create the market intelligence to be in the marketplace. Thank you, thank you, Vanti. Okay. okay, my first question, Vanti. Uh, so, uh, what are the key uh, drawing factors uh, for a shipping company uh, or a maritime service provider to establish 
this business in Singapore. Okay, all right. Yeah. Well, there's a question that most people ask, you know, <laughs> okay. why should I be in Singapore? Um, yeah. I think, first of all, uh, political stability is actually a key draw. Uh, and then, of course, the, pro, the way the government uh, works with the, uh, the um, community is also important because uh, we adopt a very pro-business um, uh, attitude. Largely because, as government, we are very good policy makers and regulators, but we may not know the industry and the uh, uh, inputs from the industry on what uh, are their business requirements uh, would actually be very essential to ensure that um, any policy that is actually implemented actually meets the needs of the uh, community. It doesn't make sense if the government comes up with a, a policy or a or a program that there are no takers because at the end of the day, it is a bad reflection of the government. Uh, so um, the pro, um, uh, the political stability, the pro business uh, environment, um, the willingness uh, to listen um, to the community, and uh, most important of all, I, I think it is the collaborative eff uh, uh, efforts and relationship that we have with the industry because uh, we work very closely with the uh, industry as well as the unions, because um, uh, only if you have got a very effective and cohesive tripartite relationship, then can you actually move, uh, move things forward. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Ben Fee. Uh, so now I will go into another, uh, another element, the, uh, the human element. Mm. So human capital is very important for the growth uh, and the success of any company, and uh, of, of obviously in the maritime sector or any other sector. What are the different aspects of manpower capabilities that Singapore seeks to develop in partnership with the industry? Okay, all right. Well, that, that is a question that's very close to the hearts of uh, the Singapore government and, and, and myself as well. Um, largely because Singapore is so small, uh, on a good day you can move from one end to another end in just under an hour. Uh, so which then means that the only resource that we have are really the, the people uh, and, and the talent. Uh, so, in the case of uh, talents development and uh, capability building, we take a very deliberate approach. Yeah. So, uh, in MPA, as we actually need, uh, look at the needs of the industry, uh, our end objective is actually to be able to create a pipeline of maritime ready workforce. And what do we mean by maritime ready workforce? So, we will start uh, at a university level. Yeah. So, we call that pre-employment uh, uh, training. So with the university, uh, MPA work closely uh, with the uh, universities to ensure that their curriculum uh, actually reflects what the industry wants. And also uh, with the students. Uh, internship is actually important for the students because uh, then they, it brings to life you know, what they actually learn uh, in school. Uh, one of the uh, areas that we, we have done is actually to allow and to provide experiential learning for the students. So MPA created what we call a global internship program, whereby in order to uh, uh, let the students know that, hey, the industry that you're working in is really a global industry. It is an exciting industry, yeah? Because um, maritime is not a natural choice for most students, so you need to create that bus. So to us, creating that bus is to show the how dynamic the industry is and how global the industry is. So we created a global internship program, again working with the companies, uh, whereby um, uh, MPA will fully fund the cost of the internship allowance as well as the cost associated with an internship. But the internship must have two components. One will be local internship and the other one will be an uh, overseas internship. Yeah. Uh, largely because um, we wanted to show the students that it is actually a global industry and it is good for them actually to have a stint overseas. Yeah? So that actually kind of differentiates our internship with the rest of the internship offered by the universities. Yeah? So um, that's what we are doing. And we also uh, engage students in the industry uh, efforts. So for example, you know, um, in this week's program, we also bring in the students uh, to participate. Uh, and and uh, we also bring them uh, when we did our so-called maritime trail. So the whole objective is actually to create the enthusiasm uh, in the students so that when they graduate, they will think of maritime as a possible career choice. Um, then the other area that we will look at will be those in the industry. Yeah? Um, 
it is very important for people to have relevant skills and uh, the industry is also changing. So we also work with the community on uh, ensuring that the skills remain relevant. Two important parts that we look at, one of course is uh, um, uh, you know, to update them on uh, what is happening. So for example, when Intertanko or BIMCO decides to set up masterclass in charter parties or even in cybersecurity risk, you know, which is one of the emerging risks, uh, we work with uh, the uh, organisations and then we encourage uh, the companies to send their staff for training. Yeah, we also with the companies to send their local staff back to head office for training. Yeah, so that is also to ensure that uh, there is minimal gap between head office and and local, uh, and so that the local staff also feels um, that um, like enthusiasm actually to 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 work uh, together with HQ. And if the local staff understands head office culture and head office work of, uh, way of working, then it is actually much more effective for them and they can carry out their work better. Uh, we also feel that this is important because then your local staff, when they go to overseas, can actually meet with the clients overseas. Uh, and then for the client, once you meet a person, there's actually the assurance that when uh, they pass on the business to them in Asia, you know, then there's a familiar face and they feel comfortable about it. Yeah. Uh, so um, this, these are some of the things that, uh, that we do. Um, but our success in uh, building up a pool of uh, maritime ready students or maritime ready workforce can only be successful if we work with the companies. So the companies must tell us what is it that they need. Uh, and today we've actually entered into a very uh, important transition period because what we're going to do today is actually talk about the skills for tomorrow. Because the industry is changing, the industry is evolving, and if you do not equip your people with the right skills, then you know it, it, then there will be knock-on effects on the business uh, going forward. Very insightful. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Terence? Yeah. Uh, Twenty. We know uh, uh, now the global environment uh, is always uh, fraught with uh, challenges and uh, dynamic changes. Uh, such as trade uh, tensions between countries and the availability of finance. Of course, uh, I think it also uh, presents many opportunity, opportunities to tap on. So <clears throat> where do you see uh, the challenges coming from uh, for the industry or more specifically for Singapore? Uh, are there any specific area you uh, would like to reinforce going forward? So there's always a saying, the Chinese always have a saying that uh, in um, every danger you know, or challenges, there's always an opportunity for you to tap, tap on. But the challenge is really finding that right opportunity uh, to tap on because it's not easy when you're actually faced with uh, a multitude of uh, challenges. Um, then the question is how do you actually then find the opportunity uh, to write on. But unfortunately, all of us are in a position that you've got no choice but to move forward because if you do not move forward, then you'll be left behind. So uh, we all will have to crack our brains um, to think of what we need to do. Uh, in the case of uh, Singapore, uh, when we actually look at uh, all these challenges, we also realise that um, we cannot just depend on physical flow of cargo. Uh, because um, the fiscal flow of cargo will be uh, impacted by trade wars, you know, because once there's trade war and then tariff changes and then it affects the flow of cargoes. Um, and then um, uh, it also will be affected, you know, by the ship sizes. So if there are actually much more direct calls, that will impact on our, on our, on our port. Uh, so there are multitudes of uh, such challenges um, that we are seeing. Um, so one of the... Um, so we rationalised and, and, and said that perhaps you know, uh, we should not just be looking at physical flows, but we should actually be looking at much more an integrated flow concept. Uh, so it means that looking at physical flow, looking at financial flow and looking at information flow. Yeah. Um, so um, these are some of the things uh, that we are uh, looking at. Uh, how to come up with some of the business solutions and, and, um, and how, how do we look at the right opportunity to go in. Uh, if I may elaborate further on then what are our plans. And, and because of all these changes, uh, we also realised that what we have on hand were, are no longer sufficient to equip us going forward. Uh, because um, one, uh, 
globally, there's so much more trade tensions nowadays. Yeah. Two is the pace of technology that has gathered. That means that the way you look at your business model today may not be adequate. Uh, in the past, we know who our competitors are, but today, you know, your competitors can be an uh, open platform uh, that may take away part of your business. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, um, not for forgetting consolidation within the industry. So consolidation within the industry affects you just as much as it affects us because uh, for us, when our customers get bigger, their voices also get louder, which means that their demands also get heavier. So the, then the question is, uh, how do we continue to ensure that Singapore remains a good place for maritime business? Uh, hence, we have actually developed two uh, master plans. Uh, one which we call the New Generation Port 2030, yeah, because um, we think uh, after 2030, then we'll move to 2050, but we need to do at least the immediate uh, period of time. So we've got the New Generation Port 2030, the International Maritime Centre 2030. Yeah. What does each of the plans mean? Uh, so in the case of the New Generation Port 2030, um, our long-term vision is to move all the container terminals to Tuas Port, which is the far uh, west. Yeah. Uh, and for planning um, parameters, we say that uh, we should be able to handle up to 65 million TU of container throughput yeah, for planning. And we've got no choice because that's the last piece of land that we have that we can actually reclaim. So you better make use uh, of, of that land. Um, and if you are going to handle up to 65 million TU of container throughput, then it means that in terms of the way we actually handle the port and the port business, it will have to be very, very different from today. Yeah? Today you handle... 36.6 million using this set of uh, resources and this set of capability. But to move towards handling 65 million, up to 65 million, then your resources demand plus your manpower capability will be totally different. Yeah. So then the challenge is how do you ensure that you can actually move uh, systematically and without much hiccups from where you are today to um, uh, 2030 and beyond. Transport is expected to last us 2040 and beyond, yeah, because there's no more other piece of land that we have in, in Singapore. Yeah. So which means that the whole drive will be how to make the port to be much more efficient and building your people to have the right skill sets. Yeah. So one example that I, I, I can quote is that in the past, uh, we, uh, for the port operations, it is one man, one machine. So you have the uh, uh, crane operator uh, out in the container yard. But today, um, they are actually working out from an office. So we are actually using uh, remote operations. And that is good because one man can actually then handle three or four uh, <coughs> containers as opposed to one man, one machine. Yeah? So there's actually limitation. And best of all, it's uh, gender neutral because in a business, in an office environment, you can also employ females. Yeah? So those are the things that we are looking at. And also, how would shipping look like come 2030? You know, there will be greater demand for just-in-time concept. And if we are able to do that well, telling the companies, look, come at a certain time at, uh, on, on, on a certain day, um, it will allow the ship captains uh, the ability to make a decision whether to fast, you know, to, to uh, slow steam or to actually uh, uh, move faster. And if there's slow steaming, then, of course, then there's a bunker fuel uh, savings. You multiply by the price per tonne. There's quite a substantive savings for the companies. Yeah. So new generation port 2030 must be a much more intelligent port going forward. Then the other part will be on International Maritime Centre. So this is the non-port business where we want to actually uh, attract shipping companies to base their operations in Singapore. Then again, what new business models will eventually morph out you know, uh, 10, uh, 10, 20 years down the road? How should we ensure that our infrastructure and our, uh, uh, and our people are able to cope up with uh, uh, such skills. How do we help companies to integrate uh, robotics uh, process application and technology into what they are doing today? So uh, the IMC 2030 has this vision uh, that we are all striving to, uh, towards uh, to make uh, Singapore as a, as a uh, global maritime hub for connectivity, innovation, and talent. Because we think that these will be the three key elements that will drive shipping forward. Connectivity is not about physical flow. Connectivity is about physical information and uh, financial flow. Uh, innovation is important because uh, 
most of the shipping companies have actually cut as much cost as they have. Yeah. But now they will have to actually look at new ways of uh, reducing costs. Uh, maybe it's actually re-looking at business processes or it may be actually including you know, uh, platforms as part of their uh, revenue sources. Yeah. Because your charter rates is predetermined in a way by demand and supply. So what additional sources of revenue do you have to uh, look at? And then the other one is talents because uh, people drives uh, the business. Uh, hardware is the same, you know. Uh, but the, the, the element that makes a great difference will be your people. So the more equipped your people are, the better it is for the company. Thank you, Thank you Bank Thief. Uh, we are now, I think, at the end of our oh, session. Okay. All right. So if I, can, yes. if I can summarize connectivity, innovation, yes. and talent, yes. these are the three things that you're looking yes. forward to. That's right. So I'd like to thank Bank Thief. Mm. Uh, for being with us. Also, I'd like to thank Espen. Uh, I think, frankly, your presence here uh, is uh, tremendous in terms of uh, what you're doing, what Singapore is doing and has achieved. So thank you very much. And I'd like to thank Terence thank for um, allowing us to be with you today. May I yeah. just thank the audience as well. Thank you so much uh, for walking this uh, journey with us. I think there are many of you here that M MPA has worked closely with. Um, the Singapore Maritime story is not a story that belongs to MPA alone, but the uh, uh, Singapore Maritime story is a story, you know, that's shared by all of us, you know, the uh, uh, private sector, the unions, because uh, without uh, the contribution of everyone, we would not have come so far. Thank you so much.